I'm assuming everybody here knows Uncle Mike, so the man needs no introduction, but we're really excited to, to be able to do stuff like this again and have the opportunity to uh, to have Mike prepare you guys some food so we can try out some samples. It was done a little differently, which Mike will explain, but uh, without further ado, Uncle Mike. Well, good afternoon. So I appreciate that. We can start off with just some real basics. Dutch ovens have existed for generations. They were so highly valued during the Lewis and Clark expedition that it was actually listed in their manifest of what they took with them on the big core of discovery. And they took Dutch ovens with them because with a Dutch oven, you can cook anything. They could trap, they could hunt, they could forage, they could fish, they could trade and, and get supplies. And whatever it was, they could cook it in one of these cast iron three-legged pots. And the reason they could is because with one of these, you can fry in it, you can bake in it, you can saute in it, you can roast in it. There's absolutely nothing that you can fix at home in your own kitchen that you cannot fix out here in the woods in a Dutch oven. My first experience with a Dutch oven was my dad purchased one. He bought this pot that looked very much like this one right here. It was a 14 inch diameter lodge Dutch oven. And he took that with his camping. And what he would do is he would build a big fire and then he would shovel some coals to the side and he would set this down on the fire. He simply used it as a big skillet and he would fix a mixture of, of various breakfast ingredients or he would make a stew in it. Fast forward a couple of decades, my son got into scouts and I recall a scout camping trip and it was a father-son event. Each father-son was responsible for their own camp setup, your own cooking. So I brought the Dutch oven along and I would see dad and son with their campfires, burning their fingers as they were trying to open up the foil packet that they had put inside the coals to make a hobo stew or a pocket stew where you take some meat and vegetables, wrap it up in foil, put it on the fire. And then I could see them picking through the burnt on the outside, raw on the inside ground beef, the crunchy carrots, the burnt onions. My son and I, we had meatloaf and crescent rolls. You can do anything in a Dutch oven, you can do at home. What do you need to do to get started? The first thing you want to do is not burn down the forest or burn yourself. So you don't burn down the forest when you have a burn ban by not using anything with, with ashes or sparks. What I did today, instead of using charcoal and or wood fire coal like I would normally do, is I used this propane stove with a device on it. This is a heat diffuser. So this plate sat on top of the burner. The Dutch oven sat on top of the plate. Now the way Dutch ovens work best is you've got heat underneath, which is why the legs are lifted up so you can have a heat source underneath that's not smothered or right up against the fire where you're going to get heat you don't control as much as you do with airflow and it has a lid with a lip on it that will allow you to put your coals on and the coals won't fall off over the edge so normally you have coals on the top and coals underneath can't do that with propane but what you can do is camp chef have a device that is creatively called a dutch oven dome and what this device does is it takes and reflects the heat upwards and inward and that provides heat all around the Dutch oven. This whole thing packs down into a box that is square like that size and about that thick. So it doesn't take a lot of space. These work great for casseroles, for stews, for anything that's going to have some liquid that's going to give you a degree of forgiveness in your cooking. They're a bit more of a challenge when you're baking. We played around with it today, uh, baking cookies. And so our goal was to to make cookies for y'all to try. And we've made cookies more times than I can remember and have had great success with them over the years. The thing we haven't done is bake cookies without using real fire from a wood burning or a coal source, but using this. And so some of the fine tuning is there are some cookies that may be about the same color as the edge of the pot on the bottom. I could tell they were burning because it smelled like it was burning, which is the technique of determining when something is done in a Dutch oven. If it smells like it's done, it's done. Now, if you're at home and you smell something in the kitchen, boy, that smells good. Then you think, but you still got time to cook it. But if you're at camp, you smell, it smells like it's smelling pretty good in the Dutch oven. You're probably done at that point. And so it's time to take a good look and maybe get it off the fire. So we'll see some various levels of quality on these cookies. A month ago, 
I did the same demo doing holes, ended up with one giant chocolate chip cookie, which was amazing. And it tasted great and it worked out great. Um, and so I thought I would duplicate that today. So I didn't put a whole lot of effort in how I put the cookie dough in. And as a result, because I used a preheated oven, it cooked into co cookiness before cookie giantness. And so, again, they're samples should you want to test your luck. Um, what do you need when you get started? You need to not burn down the forest, so you use propane if it's going to be a, a, a burn ban. But the other thing you don't want to do is burn your hands. And so I strongly encourage people to get a good set of leather gloves. There are commercial brands like Lodge or Camp Chef that have their logo on them that are available for sale. You can also purchase just a set of welding gloves. That's kind of what these uh, brown ones are. They can last a long time whether you take care of them or not. Um, and gloves are, to me, the most critical device that you have to assist you in your Dutch oven cooking. Because if you've got hot coals and you need to get the lid off the oven, you can use your glove to lift that lid up. Now, you don't want to hold on to it very long because those coals and the heat from that iron having heated up is going to give you problems. So you might be better suited to say, instead of using my gloves to lift the lid off of the oven, I need some sort of a device to lift it. There is such an animal. It has a technical name. It is called a lid lifter. A lid lifter can be something as simple as this piece of bent heavy duty wire that you hook under the lid and you just lift it straight up. Now the problem with this simple one is it doesn't take a whole lot of jiggling and all of a sudden all of my coals have fallen off and maybe given me a little bit of mineral fortification in my pot and that's something that I want to avoid. And so I can go to a commercial brand, and they're not but about 10 bucks. You can use a claw hammer, that'll work. Uh, some people will take channel locks and clamp it by the end, and after they've grabbed it a few times and chipped off part of the, the lip, they learn that cast iron, as hard as it is and as much as it will break your toes, it has a brittleness to it. So you don't really want to grab it by the sides, but a lifter that you can lift up with a little bit of side stability is a nice thing to have. I've got several of them here. This one has just the bar across the top. This one has a little bit more of an angled bar, which gives it a st better support. This is my favorite style. This particular company, uh, the Mare Lid Lifter, uh, is, is no longer made, but there are other companies that make a similar lid lifter that allows you to have such a degree of control over your coals that you can do anything you want with it and not lose control of, of where it goes as long as your arm strength holds out. Basically, you need something not to burn your hands, you need something to lift the lid off. Now, if you're cooking and you've got your lid lifted off, you're stirring some things, you need to set your lid down for a second. Unless you like the flavor of dirt and forest duff or grass in your food, you're going to need somewhere to set that lid. Some people will set it on three rocks, you can wad up three pieces of aluminum foil to make kind of a triangle and set it on top of that. Other folks will spring for a lid stand. And there are very simple ones that are available to purchase that pack easily. And you can set your lid on one of these guys so that when you're cooking and you need to check what's in the pot and you need to give it a stir, you're not going to end up reintroducing stuff off the ground into your food. The nice thing about these particular lid stands is you can also take them, invert them, put coals under them, set your lid on top of them, and now you have a griddle. Whether you need to warm up tortillas, whether you're going to just do some quick eggs, make some pancakes, you've got one less thing to pack in your kit because you have a griddle that's come with that. Now what some people will do is they will actually use their lid stand as a lid lifter, which is a great idea until you realize you have nowhere to put your lid because you've used your stand to lift it with. So if you're gonna go this route, get two. Normally, I like to use charcoal and there's lots of different types of charcoal out there. I'm a fan of Kingsford charcoal. That's what I use because I get a consistent burn out of Kingsford charcoal briquettes that I can count on once I get them lit and on my cook station that I can have 45 minutes to about 55 minutes of good coals. I don't have that consistency with other brands. So how do you light without lighter fluid? Anybody ever use a charcoal chimney? It's a device that you can put a couple of sheets of newspaper underneath, put your charcoal in the top, light the newspaper. The heat is going to be drawn up through this chimney and it will light your coals 
more thoroughly and more quickly than lighter fluid. But now what do we do with these coals? We've got to move them around. I do one of two things. I either use a little shovel, and I like this little fireplace shovel that has the, the grate to it because I can shake out the ash and still keep the hot coal. You don't have to have one of these. You can do everything without it, but I like these. I do strongly encourage people to have a pair of long-handled tongs because with these you can pick up your charcoal and you can place it where you want it and reposition it, and when you drop it, you don't have to bend down as far to pick it up. These are really handy. Have a dedicated set for your cooking. If this is also going to be the thing you're going to turn your hot dogs with, you're going to have people that are going to be less fans of your hot dogs than they might otherwise be. My normal protocol is to say, this is a Dutch oven cook table, except this isn't. This is a propane stove. It can be a Dutch oven cook table very simply by putting something on it that'll keep the coals from flying through, which is what this hog feed pan, that will hold your coals, that will keep your ashes from blowing everywhere, and it's a handy device. So I use these guys all the time. So if I wasn't bringing my Dutch oven cook table with me, I'd still bring, and I was bringing the stove here, I would still bring these pans. You don't need a table. You can cook squatted down by the campfire. But there will come a certain point in life, if you have not found that yet, that your knees will thank you and your back will thank you for bending like this rather than what I'm not going to demonstrate. Dutch oven tables usually come with a metal shield across that'll cross the front and the sides that's a wind screen that will cut out some of the eating up of your coals by the blowing of wind that can happen. I think it was a Black Friday sale at Home Depot several years ago that this $59 or $69 painter stand was on sale for less than $30. This paint stand is lightweight, easy to take anywhere I want. It gives me a bench at camp as another place to sit. The table with a couple of feeder pans can be all that you need to cook with. I mentioned that the fancy commercial tables have the windscreens that can be used, and this doesn't. But what I use for a windscreen <laughs> if, if I'm in a situation where it's cold and windy, I'm losing a lot of heat from the wind, not with this. And so something to block that wind is really helpful. How many coals do you put on top? How many do you put on the bottom? If I'm going to be frying something, I put all the coals underneath. If I'm going to be roasting something, I'm probably going to put close to an equal amount top and bottom, but a few more on the top. Heat rises, and so you don't need as many on the bottom for the most part as you do on the top. If I'm baking something, most of my heat is going to be top heat with just a little bit of bottom heat. There are formulas that suggest that you take the diameter of your pan and double that, and that's the number of coals that you need. A 12-inch pan would need 24 coals. You would put 10 underneath and 14 on the top. That's too complicated for, for this brain to, to do. What I do is a process called the Dinwiddie ring. And the way the Dinwiddie ring works is you take a ring of charcoal briquettes. If I put a ring of coals around the top of good sized coals connecting side by side and a similar ring of coals around the perimeter of the base, you're going to have between 325 and 350 degrees. So I've stopped counting coals. This works if I use a 12 inch Dutch oven or a 14 or if I use our 8 inch Dutch oven. And so that process of coals around the lid, around the perimeter, and around the bottom, around the perimeter will get you that. Most of your recipes call for 350 degrees. Most of your casseroles call for a 9 by 13 pan. The surface area of a Dutch oven of a number 12 is just slightly less than a 9 by 13 pan. The most common temperature is 350 degrees. We put a ring of coals on the top, a ring on the bottom. The most common size pan called for in casseroles or cakes and things like that are 9 by 13s. Your 12 inch Dutch oven will work for that. So what we did today to honor the burn ban, <clears throat> um, we used a propane stove. We used the cooking dome that I showed you a second ago and baked some cookies. And some of them are just amazingly burnt on the bottom. The first batch came out and we like ours soft and chewy. So the, the bottoms were, were getting good and the tops looked a little soft and chewy. So I thought we're great there, but maybe I need to turn the fire up just a little bit. I did, took those out, went to the second batch and the fire had still been turned up, and I had more bottom heat than I needed. And while if I were using coals, I could have done it without burning because I'm much better at managing that heat because I can physically put heat on or take heat off. Not so with the propane. So the second batch, I was reminded of that lesson that if it smells burnt, it's burnt. And so Daniel can show you the burnt ones. If you like black and crusty cookies, number one, you're weird, but secondly, 
he has those. And, and he, we brought those along rather than throwing them in the trash to show you that it happens. There's, there is both science to this and there's art. And sometimes art is not pretty. Daniel is ready to give you some samples over here if you'd like some. If you're looking for ideas over time, you can stalk me on the internet. Um, on Facebook, we've got a page. It's Uncle Mike's Outdoor Kitchen. And we put pictures up there and, and show and tell some recipes and would be more than happy to stay in touch through that if you've got questions over time. And with that, I'm going to say, I'm in. We're done. Casseroles, cobblers, things that are sticky, they take a little bit more work to clean out the inside. We use a plastic scraper. We just scrape it off. Sometimes I will use some sort of a scrubby or a brush. Um, primarily what I'm going to do, if I've got stickiness either from a sauce or from a cobbler or something like that, I'm going to put water in the pan and I'm going to use some form of a mild abrasive, whether it's my hand, the scrubby chain mail scrubber, something that will break loose those particles. Scrapers work as well. The best technique for me is to put water in the pot, put the lid on the pot, put the pot on the fire, get the water up to a boil. It steams, and in that steaming, it's going to loosen up most of what's in there, and then wipe it out, dry it off, and pack it away dry. The way that you keep it from rust, you put something over the surface that keeps oxygen from getting to the iron. Oxygen, iron, ferrous oxide, rust. You don't want that. So if you've got some sort of a barrier to keep the oxygen from getting to the iron, you're not going to have rust. With cast iron, the barrier that we have is what people call seasoning. And seasoning is nothing more than a carbon base layer of molecules that are covering the iron that are keeping you from getting any water to them or any oxygen to them. You get a carbon base layer by putting some sort of oil, some sort of cooking oil in, wipe it around, cover the whole thing, heat up the pan till it gets to about 300 degrees, and then wipe out every bit of oil that you can. You will not wipe it all out. There will still be a very thin layer. Then you heat it up, preferably in your oven at home so you can test your smoke alarms, and you heat it up so it gets past the smoking point. Different oils have a different smoking point. Olive oil, very low. Um, avocado oil is higher. You get up to um, flax, higher. So you, I just use vegetable oil, Crisco, bacon grease, whatever I've got, that I just use any kind of oil. But you get it up to the smoke point. Once it's all the smoke stops, you turn off the oven, let it cool back down, and you go through the process a couple more times to build up very, very thin layers of this seasoning will keep from rusting. A good seasoning <clears throat> that's several layers, that's a good solid seasoning, is gonna hold up for a, a very good period of time. It'll also hold up against soap. If your pot's properly seasoned and you rinse it well, you're not gonna be eating soap. But you do wanna put it away dry, not wet. You do wanna put it away dry, not wet, that is correct.